Oh, hi there. Welcome back to the Agostino Zynga Show with me, your host, Agostino Zynga. This is episode number 222. That's 222. Dos, dos, dos. Duh, duh, duh. With me, your host, Agostino Zynga, coming at you live and direct somewhere in the heart of East London. It might be Stratford. Could be Bethnal Green. Could be Mylen. Could be Beckton. Canning Town. Ilford. East Ham. Apton Park. Whatever it may be. I'm here live and direct, baby. And as you guys are watching via YouTube or if you're hearing via the audio podcast, you might think, oh, why does it sound kind of weird wherever Agostino is? You know why? Because it's nighttime, right? I just ran back home. or well, I ran back, well, kind of near home anyway. I ran back like three and a bit miles from the office that I'm working somewhere around London and back to where I live now. Um, I'm planning to do three miles each day until Friday, right? I'm trying to um, crank up my mileage. I think last week I did 10. This, I'm just trying to crank up to how I was previously in my, you know, in my ex life when I was a bit more of a runner than I am now. I tend to head up to the gym, so I'm trying to crank up a little bit more. So yeah, it's night time, and I thought, you know what? It's the end of the day. I might as well record a podcast before I go to bed and just talk about loads of things that I've seen on the internet, things that I think are interesting, things that I stumble upon, and all that malarkey. Because it's been a while, isn't it? It's been a while since I've uploaded double podcasts in a week. Um, as per usual, I think not as per usual, but. It seems as if um, I've allowed life's, you know, um, twos and throws to kind of throw me, of course. I usually try to keep like a schedule of three podcasts a week or something along those kind of lines. Minimum of two. Last week was one. The week before that was two. So I want to get back onto the wagon or back onto the horse, uh, as per se, this week and just try and get things where it needs to be. Um, as usual, this is a great outlet for me, in it? To kind of just talk about things that I think are interesting and whatever maybe. may be. And podcasting is the best, isn't it? What else? What other forms of entertainment do exist out there that are better than this? You know, movies are right. Movies are quite decent. I, I wanted a bit of a Jane Bond binge recently. I've just finished watching uh, Skyfall. So I'm trying to watch all of... Um, I've got one more. I think Spectral, right, is left for Dan- Daniel Craig's James Bonds. So I went through all that. And, you know, it's great movies. I'm, I'm really upset that no one really forced me to watch them because Daniel Craig's an amazing James Bond, right? He did, he did a really, really good job. But, you know, it's just a movie, right? Um, I don't think they compare to the, value, the amount of entertainment and just bang for your buck you get from watching a podcast or listening to one. No, number one, they're free. Even if they've got loads of annoying ads in them, they're still free, right, for the most part. And um, you get put onto so many different things. Someone will recommend a TV show. Someone will recommend a movie. Someone will recommend an album. Someone will recommend someone to go on holiday, uh, things to check out, whatever, right? There's so many things that you get for free, value out of a podcast. It's just amazing. You get the added advantage of just having to listen to people talk about, you know, their, their days and lives, whatever it may be, that whittles away a lot of time, especially if you're working nine to five. Honestly, like working nine to fives have never been, have, has not been as, I don't think there's ever been a time working in 95 has been more fun than it is nowadays, right? If you're a self, if you're um, a productivity uh, whore like I am, right, or you just like to eke as much out as you can out of the day, or you just don't like to be bored, there's never been a better time than now to be in a 95, right? Especially a desk job. Uh, I, I get it, if you're working in the service industry, it's pretty difficult to be serving people drinks and having one ear, <laughs> one headphone on listening to Joe, uh, Joe Rogan podcast, whatever it may be. But for the most part, if you're working in an office job on a desk somewhere in a studio, wherever it may be, you have got it cool because you can either listen to all your music you want in your life, right? Every every fucking song you want, you can stream it over the airwaves. No need to carry your um, physical uh, music library with you. you. Remember that that was a thing, right? Before even forget cassettes and CDs, iPods were a thing, right? You have to carry your physically carry your flipping um, music streaming or you know, your music collection all on one iPod crazy or you had three or four like i did i think i had about two i think i had two two ipods altogether but now you can listen to whatever you want you can listen to podcasts it's just a great way to kind of wait away the time but you know and i enjoy doing mine so here i am back again on your podcast platform so big up everyone listening on audio big up everyone listening watching via the youtube we're back live and direct ready to get in this as you can tell i just got myself a fresh new trim Oh, yeah, it's always looks trims look amazing on YouTube, isn't it? When you get a fresh trim, it looks like fucking HD. Look at it, it looks mad. I look at like one of those football players on on you know on like FIFA or on Pro where they've got those amazing haircuts. Um I saw you just sort out this top bit. I don't, I don't know what I'm gonna do. I, I think I might braid it. I think I mentioned before I was gonna braid it, do the kind of like you know, Lou Uzi Vert sort of braids in the back there. That might be a thing. Um but yeah, for now, just gonna let the top run free, run free, young child. Um, so yeah, what's happened to me? What's happened? What's happened? What's update? 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 Para me? Para me? Para me? Update? What's been going on? 
So, number one, I've been DJing a bunch, right? I'm last gig in a, in a series of three is coming up this Friday at Star Bethnal. So, if you're around the Star Bethnal and you want to have a boogie, come on down and see me play. Um, and that's the last gig of the kind of Star Bethnal franchise. I went and played at the Leighton Star. I played at the Heathcote Star, which is kind of my home base. And I'm playing now at Star Bethnal on Friday, which should be fucking amazing, right? Um, but yeah, it's been an interesting turn of events. As per usual, I'm kind of the go-to. Uh, if someone cancels, they kind of run to me and ask me to kind of play, which can be you can take that one way. You can take it one way as if like you know, you know, you don't get offered a re- a regular residency on Saturdays to play. But it's also a great opportunity for myself, selflessly, selflessly, right? I don't care what, why they decided to hire me in, the, in that regard. It's just an opportunity for me to play out. I've listened to so many. I get a lot of my, you know. Uh, work ethic or how to conduct myself or how to go about or how to approach what I do in terms of DJ I get a lot of my kind of um, information from stand-up comedians right I think they're in a similar sort of realm in realm industry I don't know what they call like the format is similar right it's one person on the stage doing something um, maybe the the kind of no the format isn't maybe the overall aspect of how they deal with the industry is similar right um how to kind of get well known in the comedy comedy circles probably as long if not longer than the DJing circles right you basically have to work your way up from open mics to shitty booking somewhere to eventually maybe getting a booking agent or manager to then take you on to other shows and you just have to work your way up and they always say I think there's a 10 year mark where you start to get good right before 10 years you're just absolute dog shit so um 10 years when you start to kind of get your wheels up you know you try to take take your training wheels off and start to kind of cycle on your own and i think the djing world is kind of the same because both and both kind of fields have a very low bar of entry right you don't need to do much to be a dj right you just have to have an interest in music and then kind of pursue that over a period of time hone your craft develop a sound um obviously have some sort of technical ability um obviously maybe arrive at a certain time you know maybe have a certain sort of perspective that no one else has blah 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 eventually you get to a stage where you want to get to comedians the same sort of realm so i kind of take my lot of my inspiration from them and um they always say in their kind of comedic circles whether it's a joe rogan crew or some of the new york cats for um loose j gomez or those dudes they always really emphasize the idea of always getting up right getting up getting up getting up and that means kind of like always going on stage always going to an open mic performing every day like uh, in the la circuit they try to no i think new york is more so they bounce around from club to open mic to open mic like every night of the week right just hustling just kind of getting your sets and reps in uh because that's the only way you're going to get better at you know doing the thing you're doing doing it more often so the message i remember hearing when i was running and i was starting to do all the kind of you know wacky sort of like um cheat not cheat running but you know the kind of stuff that you don't have to really run like oh just do this and you don't have to do three mile run and then it, you know eventually got it got back around to the whole idea of like no if you want to get better running you just have to run there's no but there's no hack to running if you want to run a marathon you have to run a marathon right there is no other way to go that you got trained like you're running a marathon so but the difficulty with djing i found is that there isn't an abundance of places to go and play right well if you're an open mic or you're a comedian if effectively if you've got a microphone in your hand you can tell jokes anywhere literally anywhere right it doesn't really matter even without a microphone but with djing especially in london and with the maybe with the you know with the licensing laws of some boroughs not all bars are equipped to host djs or to accommodate djs in that regard right some of them if they're if they are available they only have i don't know vinyl and if they don't have vinyl they don't have a pa if they don't have a pa they don't have this like there's all these little things missing so you have to kind of always set yourself up with a rig which is why the whole mobile dj thing is really big in the uk for the most part you see a lot of those kind of guys that have those massive rigs those really cheesy corny lights that look horrible you know what i'm talking about right like it's those kind of like wedding dj sort of sort of vibes right it's an industry in itself but it's not something that i kind of want to be interested in at all in the slightest let me see if i can find it mobile dj I bet you're going to see something super naff. It's like, the, you know, the kind of dude that has the microphone in his hand and saying, come on, guys, let's do it. All that sort of nonsense, right? So if you're if you're watching via YouTube, you'll see it now, right? This is a mobile DJ, right? It's sort of like this massive translucent box in the front you know, with colors on it, loads of flashlights on top of it. It's just really like, you know, the quintessential school disco sort of DJ, right? And that's kind of what we do in the UK for the most part because we don't really have a lot of places that are set up to kind of host DJ. So if you want to go and play more places, you have to get your own rig. Now, this is something I've kind of had in my mind um, for myself, uh, less so in that kind of shitty vein, but more so in a kind of David Mancuso uh, loft party. Do you remember that kind of vibe, right? Let's, um, the loft New York City, right? 
I have a kind of that sort of vibe where he used to kind of, um, if you're familiar with him, David Mancuso came up, I think around the 60s, 70s, right? He was kind of um, one of the pioneers behind, you know, uh, throwing disco parties in abandoned places or in, in weird places around New York. Uh, and then he kind of built out this place called The Loft. That was seminal uh, location. I think they featured it in The Deuce as well. If you watch The Deuce um, TV series by James Franco, that kind of talks about the uh, prostitution industry and gentrification of New York uh, throughout the 60s, 70s, and 80s. I think if you check that show out, they featured The du- um, the Loft in there. But basically, David Mancuso's whole thing was he essentially brought his own bespoke entertainment audio, visual, audio kind of system there, right? You had one deck, I think basically one deck like the best PA, uh, the best um, the best speakers, just everything really fine tuned to kind of really uh, bring uh, back the appreciation of just listening to great music on a great system. Nowadays, it's kind of divulged, it's kind of gone a bit awry, right? We're kind of more in awe of superstar DJs, but there is been a, there there is a still a, that kind of a, there is still that kind of vibe around with people like you know um, what are they called is it unknown uh, what are they called. Fuck. There's a few people that do parties around right there. Body Hammer are a good example of it. They kind of have a bespoke system they kind of put out. But in general, anyway, great, great, great idea. And it's something I've kind of um, f- floated around with in my head, right? David Mancuso, that's the, the absolute legend of kind of getting my own uh, rig. So two big ASCII speakers, a monitor, a great mixer, um, or not even a great mixer, maybe just like a one of those really good um, DG, DD, DDJ SBs from Pioneer, they're kind of all-in-one units. They've got a really, really good one now that I used when I went to go play an art gallery once. So this girl hired out for me. That was really good quality. It's amazing. It kind of basically is a good way of getting a, two CDJs, one Mark, Pioneer, Mark, Pioneer uh, MK1000, whatever they are, in your house without having to shell out, you know, two grand on each kind of deck. You can kind of just get it all-in-one unit. But I was really, really thinking about the idea of kind of setting up my own kind of sound system. I think, let me see if I can get a sound system here. It just should be a, a kind of image of it sound system from the loft so yeah so this is kind of essentially what it sort of looked like right i think people have kind of copied it a little bit but um you really wanted the sound to be amazing uh in a place that you play but anyway uh long story short it's hard to kind of get gigs you know playing out in london so i'm really thankful for you know the opportunity i've been given by the guys that own all the, the star the all star franchise around london so big up those guys for kind of bringing me in and yeah so this friday i'm going to be playing at the star bethnal it's going to be an interesting one because i think this is the kind of that that's their marquee one i think from all the the stars that they have i'm pretty sure that's that's the one that they really kind of like you know no this is this is the spot because um I've been told, I've been given a kind of, you know, a, a set list of, not set list, I've been told what kind of music I should be playing there, which I never get told beforehand. So I'm sure they're kind of aware of like, you know, the kind of clientele that comes in there. I've been told to play from 10 to 2 a.m., which is different than what I do usually. So it's a very, very different vibe than what I'm kind of accustomed to. So it should be interesting to see how that kind of goes. But again, I'm really looking forward to it. I think it's going to be a good time. Um, by and large, I've really found the idea of playing out a lot really good. Uh, I really kind of found it a really great experience, but it's very difficult to kind of get any consistency when the equipment varies so or so fucking drastically right so i guess for the most part i always get to play on pioneer cdj's 1000 and up right so i get to have a usb stick plugged into it right that's a good thing but whether i have a link cable is completely uh dependent on where i am whether or not the mixer is a mixer i'm used to playing on is completely dependent on where i am it's all really wet very so it's very hard to kind of so you really have to i'm really thankful that i spend a lot of time going through my set list and going through what I want to play like I kind of have a feeling I think when you're I think when you get to the higher echelons of a DJ you tend to kind of go off of the vibe but I tend to have a bit of a structure where I have I have like 35 or 50 songs that I want to play for an intro I'm not gonna play all of them but the general sort of vibe and then the same for the middle and the same for the end right I've got same for the peak same for the close um and I usually kind of like steer my set around that kind of block but it's hard to kind of um, I would hate to think what would happen if I didn't have that at all, if I had just like nothing, if I just went into it completely like naked and I went just to test how I am when I went in there, I would hate it. I would hate it. 
So I'm really thankful that I kind of get to kind of do those things beforehand. But um, it kind of makes my sets a lot more easier to kind of uh, have a bit of flow, have a bit of order. Because when you get in there and you just have no idea what the mix is going to be. Like the other day at the Heath Code Star, I played on a Vestac mixer. It was the first time I've ever touched one in my life, right? I've never touched a Vestac mixer in my life ever. I've always kind of seen Alan Heath's. Uh, pioneers and stuff maybe a new mark mixer from here time to time but i've never seen a best in my life so to kind of finally to stand there in front of a best like, okay cool fx and there's different buttons on different you have to you have to split the fx from different size and the eq uh button has to be pressed in order to kind of get the high mid lows and size off and it, it's got two mid it's got two lows one it's just a whole completely different vibe but yeah um Again, I think that's the benefit of having sets and reps and doing a lot of gigs over time. You tend to kind of, you know, just tend to get a bit of autopilot when you play. It doesn't seem to be that much of a big thing. Uh, so this is the fly that I made for La Betis. I think I've got it here on the screen for you guys to check out. So that's me on the Friday at the start of Bethlehem. So if you're around the area and you want to see the old guy play, here it is, man. Here it is. The star of Bethlehem with your kid, Agostino, playing playing the handsome black man at the heath at the star of bethnal so check that out from the 6th that's friday 16th of august 10 p.m to 2 a.m should be of a bit of a banger check me out if you're out and about in that area anyway um and that's about it really isn't it? i've been running a lot been doing a lot of fasting a lot of 16 hour fasting which is i'm doing today i try and do at least three to four days a week i try to do a bit of a free so i just probably do it until wednesday and then kind of recalibrate from then on and it's been fucking awesome man Luncy, like for me i just find it really relaxing um i don't like to get stressed out about food i don't necessarily I, I'm, I'm quite lucky in the respect i'm not really much of a foodie the only indulgence i really have when it comes to food is shitty processed food or you know like shook like chocolates and biscuits and stuff that's the only achilles heel that i have when it comes to eating stuff and snacking out kind of you know if I go to suit, if I go to an off license, I'm buying a bottle of water. Like you know, try I try not look at the fucking racks full of chocolates. So it just get me dizzy. That's the only thing that gets me. But apart from that, pasta, bread, rice, uh, cheese, all that shit, I don't really care. Right? I'm not that bothered about it. Like I just, I, I essentially eat just to stay alive. So it's it makes fasting a little bit more easier for me because essentially it kind of limits. It kind of just gives me a framework of when I can eat. Right. So it's just simple. So I just eat between the hours of like let's say six when i wake up or six when i get back from the gym or running until maybe about 2 3 p.m would have my last meal and i do the same thing the next day so it's pretty simple for me that regard i can eat as much as i want in those time and that's about it so i have a big breakfast go to work have a massive lunch a couple of snacks or some fruit whatever it may be or some nuts that i might buy and i'm basically done for the day and it makes life so much easier um but for some people the whole uh fasting thing has been a bit of a a bull egg, right? So much so that I happened to stumble upon this uh, really interesting podcast. I say really interesting, but you know, um, I don't know. It's it's a podcast that really kind of threw me back a little bit. I was a bit surprised by the take some of the hosts had on it. And this podcast is the one Recode Decode with uh, Kara Swisher. Now, I have to preface this by saying that I've never been the biggest Kara Swisher fan. There's something about her tone and the way she goes about interviewing people that kind of rubs me up the wrong way she had an interview with uh elon musk a while back a while back i think maybe when he was doing the boring project or something i forgot what it was but she had one of the interviews on stage with elon musk oh no i think maybe it was during the whole like um tesla stuff right when he was uh sleeping at the office or whatever and she just came across really snarky really condescending and she just came across as somebody who has a really high opinion of herself even though by you know on paper she's just a journalist right she's don't get me wrong she's an influential journalist she's been around since the advent of startups and silicon valley she's very well respected in that industry people want people go to her in order to kind of get their story straight she's very respected and like malarkey but i just find the way she goes about stuff really annoying the fact that she wears those stupid aviator glasses like she's terminate or something of interviews is drives me up the wall as well just tiny things about her are just kind of a little bit rubby up the wrong way but again regardless of that she does she does great interviews for the most part but she, um, they put out a recent podcast. Um, I'm not sure if she's part of Rico, she's founded Rico, but whatever it is, uh, Rico Deco that she does. Um, there's different podcasts that they host on that platform, and she has one. And um, this latest one kind of uh, obviously, um, I wouldn't say triggered me, but got me thinking about how people look at things differently than how I look at things. It's just the different, you know, 
different perspectives we have on things in general as human beings and whether or not it's intrinsic or something that we learn over time. So the podcast is called Why Silicon Valley Loves Biohacking and Intermittent Fasting, right? Hosted on Rico Dico. It's up here on the screen for you guys to see, but I'll link in the show notes for you guys listening via the audio podcast for you guys to check out yourself. I really recommend you listen to the whole podcast, but really interesting. So I'll read the description for you here and it will give you uh, a little aspect of it, right? Uh, so this is here. Um, the description of the podcast episode is as follows. Um, inspired by the trendiness of intermittent fasting in the tech community, Kyle Sushi executive producer uh, Erica Anderson talks with free eating habit experts, a biohacker, an academic, and an eating disorder specialist. In this episode, um, HVM CEO Jeff Wu on the culture body of optimization, the mainstreaming of biohacking, and how humans are approaching God. Aging nutrition expert Dr. Walter Longo, who's, you know, if, if you guys that are aware of um, intermittent fasting, and you're aware of uh, Dr. Session Panda, and you're aware of, uh, oh, what's her name now? She comes on Joe Rogan all the time. I keep, why did I forget her name now? Doesn't matter, but you will, you will know who Walter Longo is. He was a fucking legend in the biohacking, I mean, the intermittent fasting field. Um, on the origins of biohacking, the science behind intermittent fasting, and the problem with Silicon Valley's interpretation of the practice, and the executive director of the National Eating Disorder, um, Claire Misko, on the line uh, between eccentric diets and disorders, the wellness industry, and what to do if someone you know needs help. Follow Carl Sutcha at da, 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 da. Anyway, so essentially, it, the whole premise of this whole podcast came from um, a couple of these people. I think Erica Anderson, the uh, producer of uh, Rico Decode, and Carl Sutcha, had both been a bit alarmed by Jack Dorsey's appearance as of late, right? Jack Dorsey is the CEO of uh, Twitter, right? So I think they had seen him at a show or a conference or something, and they were kind of taken aback by how gaunt, how skinny, and how quote-unquote unhealthy he looked according to these two women. And of course, when they kind of delved into it a little bit deeper, they found an article about um, Jack Dorsey that kind of um, spoke about his kind of day and how he kind of goes about it you know it's a general kind of thing they ask him they ask most startup founders how you kind of get so much out of the day because usually these founders are operating at a really high level and they try to understand how they go about kind of you know um, constructing the day and getting the most out of it productivity wise so because of that they kind of stumble upon the fact that he interrupts and fasts and doesn't i think he, he eats one meal a day which is dinner and he doesn't eat on the weekends and it kind of uh, surmised that that was kind of leading to his image and why he looks the way he does and also hypothesized that basically um, intermittent fasting has turned into some kind of cover for um, eating disorders. It's just a weird way. Anyway, they do preface it by saying that they're a bit hesitant to, to kind of talk about people's appearance. But, you know, again, they're doing it right. It's like that kind of quintessential thing that someone did to me the other day when I was DJing. Some dude comes up to me and says, oh, yeah, I'm a DJ too, man. And I really hate when people ask me to play a song, but can you play? It's like, if you really ask people, if you really ask it, if you really hate when people do it to you, why are you doing it to me? And you did it anyway, right? It's just like a, it's one of those weird things that people say that, you know, it just, it's kind of a, a pleasantry you kind of throw out. So the fact that they said, oh, we don't want to talk about Jack Dorsey's appearance because, you know, that's not what we're about. And, you know, it's about accepting people for their, what they are and, you know, but self-love. They still decided to kind of essentially framework this entire podcast around uh, Jack Dorsey's supposed eating disorder because he tends to not eat five meals a day and they don't consist of pasta, rice and bread and all that malarkey. So it's a really interesting, really interesting podcast, but again, something that really got me thinking. So I've made some notes regarding some topics I want to talk about and then we can kind of, kind of carry on from there. Um... So, yeah, was I, I talk about the adulation. The most interview that comes across. Da, 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 she looks gone. Yes, yes, yes. They say she... So, um, this is something that kind of got me thinking about the whole idea, right? In the podcast episode, they say the following, right? Um, say he looks... Like, they say he looks gone and skinny and unhealthy, which, you know, he probably could do, right? If you're going to eat one meal a day and you're going to not eat on the weekends and, you know, and you're running... No, let's say you're going to eat one meal a day and you're not going to eat on the weekends. You're going to look a certain way. That's just the standard. You know, we have to kind of surmise that, especially if you're the one meal a day you're eating is very nutrition, nutritionally rich, right? You're going to drop some pounds. Your skin's going to tighten up a little bit. You're going to look different. It's just a standard way of it, right? Even with keto diet now, I can, you know, my, my, my mouth feels weird since I've not had any kind of sugars, whatever, and I've kind of eliminated carbohydrates and I've been fasting since essentially 2 p.m. My mouth feels a bit gammy. You're going to feel different. You're going to look different. That's the way it should be. But the weird thing about this whole t conversation, I thought, was that they never once in the whole conversation spoke about what Jack Dorsey does as a, what's his actual job, right? And his job is to be the leader of Twitter and Stripe, 
Uh, no, uh, Stripe, no, Stripe, um, Square, uh, Square, or Square, what's that, what's that, um, company Jack Dorsey's got, is it Square Cash, Square Cash, Jack Dorsey company, is Square Cash, or am I going crazy, I'm pretty sure it's Square Cash, right, uh, Twitter and Square, that's it, cool, so he's a he's a he's a he's the head um, he's the CEO of both Twitter and Square, right? And I don't need to tell you guys anything about you know both companies, but they're pretty huge in the landscape of digital, in the landscape of the internet, right? They're huge as fuck. Um, Twitter even more so because nowadays, especially in the current social political climate that we're in, Twitter's become like you know has kind of gone through so many resurgences over the years that you know I don't know if it's in its fourth, sixth, seventh wave of resurgence but twitter's a big fucking deal right so this guy is at the helm of two companies that are like you know pioneering things in their own industry whether it's in digital economy in terms of money whether it's in social media social justice in terms of twitter he's at the helm of both those companies and if you read any book about ceos about founders most of their time isn't spent of isn't spent on kind of directing the overall planning of the company and how it's going to go and do designing cool features and letting a hand on that. Most of his time is going to be spent putting out fires, right? Uh, making sure the company doesn't burn to the ground. That's essentially his job 24 7, two, uh, seven days of the week. He's probably, even when he's meditating and he's on those silent retreats, there's probably a fail safe that he's kind of designed or he's kind of. Um, engineered or he's kind of put in place with some of the people that work at twitter where if something if xyz was to happen they have a button they can press that he could just immediately fly out from wherever he is and go straight back to the whole twitter hq in in silicon valley so he's doing all these things and i'm sure in the in the process of you know going through his um deciding on how to best run these companies He's decided to adopt meditation. He's had a different kind of diet. He kind of um, has been very forthright in terms of fronting any issue and going on stuff like Joe Rogan podcasts and other podcasts he's appeared on and giving interviews and really being upfront and trying to say he's doing better and getting people in place to kind of make some changes. He's kind of really, really trying to, he's not burying his head in the sand. That's what I'm trying to say. And the kind of process of trying to figure out how to best optimize his level of performance, because again, he's leading Twitter and Square. He's not working a nine to five somewhere in a regular job in the middle of Liverpool Street. He's leading two of the most biggest influential companies in the world, right? He decided to maybe um, do away with uh, focusing on where to get his breakfast or where to get his lunch and kind of concentrate on the one meal a day that he thinks gets the most, uh, brings in the most value and the most satisfaction. And I won't be surprised if somehow, you know, he's on call from let's say six or five in the morning until whenever he leaves work. So that dinner is sort of like a way for him to kind of mentally check out, right? Like I'm eating my lunch and I'm off for work. It's like essentially like what I'm doing now at my new, at my new job or what some people do at their, new, at their jobs in general, where you kind of leave your computer at work. You don't take your laptop back home, right? The idea behind that is that you've kind of done, right? You close the laptop and you just go back home. That's me finished for the day. I'm over. I'm not going to think about work anymore. I just come in and whatever, whatever happens, happens between now and the, and the next day, but I'll do it when I come in the morning. So maybe that whole dinner thing, is a way for him to kind of mentally uh, check in that he's kind of, you know, he's arrived home now. Like, that's it. It's over. And I'm sure he probably sits around the table with his wife or his family or whatever and kind of breaks bread and doesn't talk anything else about work anymore. So they've somehow surmised that that aspect, that kind of way of doing things has him looking gone and it might be an eating disorder, which is, again, it's really, really, really um, inconsiderate. And again, just, it kind of strikes me as... Um, it kind of strikes me as people from the sidelines seeing how the higher echelons of business people, let's say in that regard, are operating. And, you know, again, there might be some jealousy involved. I don't know what it is, but it's very interesting to observe just how forthright and how sure people are watching from the sidelines are that how people up at top doing, you know, the thing that you wish you could do should do the thing that you wish they could do. If you get what I mean, yeah, it's, do you know what I'm saying? Like, I never understood how you can be so sure that you know how Jack Dorsey should go about conducting his day-to-day, -day, uh, you know, eating habits. Like, how would you know? Like, have you ever had the day in work when you're so busy, you forget to go on lunch on the time that you're meant to go on lunch? You still go, but you forget to go on the time that you went to go, right? Let's say you're running Twitter then. How about that? You're running Twitter nowadays with Trump around, with Brexit, with the stuff that's going on in Europe, um, with the... Uh, gun violence in the u.s with the civil unrest 
in Central and South America, with the upheaval in the African econ- uh, economy, with the protests in Southeast Asia and China. Like, imagine what you'd be like if you were running that company and you were trying to make sure the house didn't burn down, that you didn't get sued for a bajillion dollars, or whatever it may be. Come on, man. There's so many things going on behind the back. And the last thing I'd be worrying about is food, but he's found a way that kind of works for him at the most part. But they, but again, these, the hosts on Rico Decode think they know completely what he should be doing. It's, it's, it's just bizarre. Um, and I read here, uh, and this is a kind of interesting um, quote here. Right? I think they mentioned this on here. They mentioned that they say that he's broadcasting the message um, about his diet. And again, I don't think he's broadcasting. I'm pretty sure they went out and saw, again, the, the host of Rico Decode saw him on stage, thought he looked unhealthy, then went and kind of dug in a bit deeper, found out, found he's kind of eating, you know, his daily plan or a weekly plan that he does. And then surmised from there, he's eating habits, right? And figured out, oh, he's doing intermittent fasting. That's probably why he looks so the way he does intermittent fasting equals um, eating disorder. Now, the issue that I have with that is that I think nowadays, anyway, especially in society, we have a, this. there's this weird idea. I think it's less more, it's more so with entertainment and now I guess celebrity culture has kind of, you know, spread into entrepreneurship uh, with, you know, how many people that you know you follow on social media have, you know, entrepreneur in their kind of bio and they don't make, they don't make or sell anything, right? Um, which is kind of bizarre in that regard. Uh, whatever, yeah, but everyone kind of has kind of wants to adopt that kind of moniker on their name. But it's interesting that with int- with entrepreneurship specifically, people don't treat entrepreneurship the same way they treat athletics or sports, right? Which they should. So when someone reads an article of Mark Zuckerberg or of Elon Musk or of Travis Kokanis, formerly of Uber, I don't know why they think if they follow the way they do things that somehow they will also launch an Uber. That's not the way things go, right? It's like if you read, if you if I somehow um, found out what LeBron's training regiment was, there's no way I'm going to end up looking like LeBron James. There's no way I'm going to end up playing basketball like LeBron James. Same way if I found out what uh, Christian Ronaldo did in terms of his acceleration or the way he plays football. I'm never going to be that level of player that he is. I might reach a certain level. I might get really high. I might get really close, but I'm not going to do anything similar to what he does, the way he does it, right? It's just one of those kind of things. You have to, you have to be aware that outliers and talented people do exist. And if those outliers telling people apply themselves and have a good work ethic, there's no way you're going to ever catch them, right? There's no way you're ever going to be able to replicate their results. So I think the same should be, the same sort of mindset should be adopted when you look at people in business, right? Those people that I mentioned, the Jeff Bezos, the Mark Zuckerbergs, the Travis Kokanises, the Jack Dorseys, these are outliers, right? Matt Mollowigs, these are people that are just like, you know, that are pushing the envelope. Elon Musk, they are the ones that are kind of, quote unquote advancing humankind right trying to push us to the next frontier um why would you why would you surmise or why would you hypothesize that they would go about their day-to-day life the way that me and you do right have you heard the phrase um uh in order to achieve an extraordinary result you have to be willing to do extraordinary things right if you if you want to do extraordinary things you have to do if you want to, if you want to have extraordinary results you have to do extraordinary things just one of those kind of i don't see why that's so crazy so i'm not I would be surprised if Jack Dorsey said he just eats hamburgers and drinks Coca Cola, right? That's the, in the same way that we were surprised when we heard Donald Trump say that, right? Because it doesn't, it's not befitting of somebody that's trying to lead a nation that he's going to be, you know, eating cheeseburgers and drinking Coca Cola, right? And not exercising. It doesn't really make any sense. So, why would you think that somebody who would, uh, someone like a Jack Dorsey, yeah, with maybe a computer science background, maybe an engineering background, would try and engineer a solution that works best to try and eke out the most um uh value from his kind of day-to-day life like why would this be surprising and why would you or why would i as a normal person as a layman think that if i copied what he does that i'm also going to launch an app like that it just doesn't make any sense but again i guess it kind of buys into this whole thing that you know the issue that i have with startups in general especially ones in london that you know i run like shit mostly everyone's trying to copy whoever is in front of them right and trying to kind of you know replicate that result or is or if they're lucky uh be able to kind of you know ipo or get absorbed by a big company cash out and go you know sip a mai tai somewhere on the beach but for the most part i just i don't know i, I was surprised that they thought he was broadcasting it and and i was surprised that they surmise that people are going to be influenced by that and start having you know it's like what makes no sense and then uh, another bit i really thought i was um 
uh, uh, that was interesting was this bit here at the bottom which says we need to define what health is and i guess this is the overall point of it to kind of end this one rambling on a bit too much about it but the overall end feeling i got from this was that essentially what this whole debate around jack Dorsey's eating habits has kind of centered around is um what i've kind of seen a little bit happen in the whole fat acceptance movement um which i have no problem with being a former fatty myself i know how difficult it can be to navigate around the world uh being a bigger person right um the world isn't really set up to accommodate you in that regard especially a place like london um it's very small it's very old um it's very victorian in that regard the streets are small we're getting bigger and bigger you know as generations progress and as the food gets better as we try to eat out more nutrients we're beginning becoming larger and larger and larger and we don't really have a um uh, an environment that kind of kind of accommodate for all our you know heights perhaps and weights whatever it may be right but there is another part of the fact that Texas movement, which I'm not really down for, where they're trying to redefine what health is, right? In order to fit their own narrative. And you see that a lot now, where it's like, oh, just because you're skinny doesn't mean you're healthy, just because you're fat doesn't mean I'm not healthy. Which, you know, is right. They both can be right, but you can't tell me that being obese is optimal for your way of, is optimal for your life in general. You can't tell me that that is true. And you can't tell me that you don't suffer from any um, ill effects of health from you know essentially allowing yourself to eat unhinged or allowing yourself to do whatever you want with your body there has to be some level of care you take with yourself it's not to do with anyone else just just for yourself you just take some care in maintaining or making sure you're at an, a level of health that's allowing you to just be of use or be of value to the people around you right that's just i don't know whether well, well, it's not even something to do with anyone else but to do you and your family and friends but i think this whole idea um that we have to redefine health has come around the whole fact, fact, fact acceptance movement and is now spread into wellness. And um, a lot of it has kind of, a lot of it comes from a good place, I think, because in general, the whole wellness industry is maybe geared more towards women. And I guess women in general do have a lot more anxiety, a lot more trepidation, a lot more worry when it comes to their kind of self-image because a lot of their worth is basically centered around that, whether it's from the patriarchy, whether it's from conditioning from their parents, I've mentioned that story time and time again of that Brazilian friend that I had who essentially was starving herself when she came to London because she was afraid that when she goes back home to Brazil, the first thing people are going to say is that how much weight she's gained, right? One of the kind of um, beauties, one of the kind of uh, uh, things that they look forward to as young girls in Brazil is that if they work out and they went, had a great summer, when they go around to their you know relative's house, the first thing they're going to say is, oh, how skinny, and how amazing they look, right? So the opposite is true if you decided to put in a couple of LBs and you went on a trip and holiday. I was like, but I was stunned by that, right? So there's those are reasons why women are a little bit uh, neurotic when it comes to weight. But I'm also not a fan of this whole idea that wellness is now somehow a dirty word, right? Looking after yourself has now turned into uh, this idea that uh, wellness has become like it's been painted as like a white, uh, predominantly white, patriarchal influenced uh, thing now that it's essentially. Uh, promoting fad diets which is bizarre in that regard because i thought self-care sundays was like a thing that people kind of were adopting in order to kind of you know take care of themselves and you know sort of being glued to their phones and they've been watching youtube videos i don't know meditate put some cucumbers in their eyes put a bit of a face mask on light some candles and just kind of like take it easy before they start the work week again but now that's got a dirty name so i think in general there is just there's just too many people that are worried about the wrong things i think you know again if you're happy the way you are then cool but i also think you should be you shouldn't try and tell other people how they should act or you shouldn't tell other people who are trying to do crazy things that they shouldn't do crazy they shouldn't do the crazy things in order to kind of get to that crazy thing they want to get to i think people should just be left their own devices but again which is not you know in the society we live in now that's not the thing that we want to do you know they want to kind of stifle the weirdos but for the most part our eccentric folks and our weirdos have to be left unhinged to do weird st shit that's just how it should go right and us people who are you know the regular regular five meals a day um you know eating the same bread and pasta every lunchtime and you know drinking and doing drugs whatever it may be you should be allowed to do what you want to do too no one's uh, saying you shouldn't but you shouldn't uh, live you shouldn't tell other people how to live their life according to yours to make you feel more comfortable that's essentially what i'm trying to get at um which probably won't happen because i think nowadays i think you know just the society we have now people are just you know especially with social media and stuff like we live in an age where the whole nature of being alive now is to 
lend comment to what other people are doing, right? Essentially, kind of what I'm doing now on the podcast, talk about what people are doing in order to kind of make yourself feel better, which I'm not really doing anyway. I'm talking about things I'm interested in, but yeah, I just find it bizarre. So I really recommend you check it out if you're that way inclined. Um, Recode, decode. It's podcast. I don't know what episode it is, but um, you check it out. I definitely may number them. It's called uh, Why Silicon Valley Loves Black Biohacking and Internet of Fasting. Really interesting. Again, I don't agree with any of the points said. I think they are kind of trying to, uh, you know, trying to, you know, apply normal people rules or normal people ways of living to people that are doing extraordinary things which doesn't make sense in the slightest could jack dorsey do with a good night's sleep maybe could he do with a shave maybe could he do blah 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 could he do could he could he yes but am i running a you know a billion dollar company two billion dollar companies whatever it may be called and one that's at the forefront of you know social political issues and has been blamed for essentially hiring trump am i am i doing that no so if he's doing that and he also thinks this is the best way to go about life, then, you know, we have to just trust him and hope that he gets better soon or, you know, even better. We hope that he gets in a better place. He's able to look after himself to our conventional needs sooner rather than later. But I don't know. But yeah, it's an interesting podcast. I recommend you check it out regardless if you're that way inclined. And then we move on. What's next here on the docket here? Let's see what else we've got here. Scroll down. Oh, um, yeah, so the next one uh, is a weird one about um, wellness industry, right? So this is the next podcast, but this is the next, ep- um, sorry, subject I want to talk about. So this is a quote from, this is an article that I thought was quite interesting in, a, in, a, in, in, in large parts, but I also think there's a lot of misinformation in it. But, you know, again, everyone's perspective is different, so I'm not going to, you know, go too much into that one. But this really good op-ed that was posted on the New York Times, I think they mentioned it quite a lot in the Recode Decode episode that I just mentioned. Um, blah, 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 blah. Let me get it up on the screen to get to check out. So, it's this episode here. It's called Smash the Wellness Industry. If you guys can see it, can you see there? Yeah, Smash the Wellness Industry. And it's written by a lady called Jessica Nill. Yeah, Jessica Nill, uh, a novelist. So essentially, she says uh, the subtext is why are so many smart women falling for this harmful pseudoscience claims? And I'll start with the opening kind of paragraph. It kind of gives you a good overview of what the article is about. So it starts with the following. A few months ago, I had lunch with uh, the writer behind um, one of my favorite movies of the year, the agent who made the deal and the producer who packaged the project. I wanted to hear all about the process and perhaps find an opportunity to collaborate. When the server came to our order, I came to take our order. I flashed to the scene in a Romy and Michelle's high school reunion where Mira, Sov- where Mira uh, Sorvino walks into a diner in a striped skirt suit and asks the waitress, do you have some sort of businesswoman special? Um, had there been any sort of businesswoman special that day, our group probably couldn't have ordered it. Someone was slogging through the whole 30 program. Someone had an elim- eliminated dairy and someone else was simply trying to be good after a bad weekend. The producer said it didn't matter how good she was. Uh, she had lost the baby weight. And though she may look uh, tolerable in clothes, under Spanx, her stomach was a horror show. The writer said she had so many celly- she had so much cellulite on her thighs, she looked diseased. I gazed around the restaurant longingly, wondering what the men eating cheeseburgers were talking about. All right? So this is an interesting point of view, basically saying that um, the wellness industry has got crazy now where women are obsessing or over obsessing about what they're eating which is then leading to some unhealthy um, eating choices quote unquote eating disorders and just you know essentially taking yourself away from enjoying the activity of eating socially with friends which you know is a bit of a stretch but we go on um again interesting article i don't agree with some of the points on here but i just think in general it's good to get this kind of perspective because you know you kind of it kind of refines how you look at things and kind of sharpens your toolbox and how you approach these topics when you talk about them in public so um the quote that kind of stuck out to me was uh the following right uh la, la, la. so this is a here's, here's the following quote that kind of really stuck out to me in, in the kind of whole article this is the following the diet industry is a virus and viruses are smart it has survived all these decades by ad- by adapting, but it's as dangerous as it ever, as ever. In 2019, dieting presents itself as a wellness and clean eating, duping modern feminists to participate under the guise of health. Um, wellness influencers attract sponsorship and hundreds of thousands of followers on Instagram by by uh, tying before and after selfies to inspiring narratives. Go from sluggish to vibrant, insecure to confident, foggy brain to clear eyed. But when you have to dis- well, when you have to deprive, punish, isolate yourself to look good, is it possible to feel good? 
I was the sickest and loneliest when I appeared to be my healthiest. Now, I have a problem with this in general because I think, by and large, um, the people that are speaking about this, from my experience, from having listened to some of these podcasts and read between the lines what they're saying, a lot of these women, especially a lot of the, especially a lot of the women that complain about it, are the proponents of fad diets. So a lot of them are the people that, you know, they'll watch a Jennifer Lawrence movie, see that she looks amazing. Jennifer Lawrence will have some fucking stupid cockamamie fad diet that she was on. Like, you know, remember Beyonce? My, even my mum did it. Remember Beyonce? Um, what was that movie called? Where she plays a singer. Um, she was on some crazy diet. Even my, my mum did that diet, right? It was, I think it was potatoes and some shit. I think I forgot what it was. Some crazy diet. Um, women tend to do that quite often. I don't know why, but it should be quite clear. It should be quite obvious to any rational human being. So any kind of, anybody with sense that the reason why these actresses and actors do these fad diets is because they, these movie projects kind of get turned around and, you know, the, the process is long, but in general, you know, you get signed on to their project. There is a lot of time to kind of get in good shape, right? So they kind of have to just do these fad diets to kind of snap into good shape, do the film and then kind of go back into normal. But usually for the average human day to day, doing a fad diet four times a year isn't a good idea for your overall health, right? Your overall mental well-being, um, your overall eating habits. And as anyone knows that's done a fad diet, the first thing you do when you're off your fad diet is binge all the shit you've been depriving yourself of, right? And if you've read any kind of account from women that say diets don't work, essentially the main thing they say is that they list all the diets they've been on, which is, again, is a, is a red red flag that, you know, you, you're not doing things right because essentially your life is a diet, which is which it shouldn't be. Your life should be, um, you should you should kind of construct your, your life around your kind of lifestyle, right, or what you're trying to achieve or whatever it be, but it shouldn't be diets, right? There should be a way that you kind of conduct your life by and large, and there are times that you kind of might veer off the course, but by and large, you have a kind of rough framework you kind of live by, whether it's keto, whether it's paleo, veganism vegetarianism there should be a rough kind of framework that you kind of adopt and then from there you can kind of veer left and right wherever it may be but you know the, the idea that you should be indulging yourself in everything that is around you is just preposterous especially if you're trying to be healthy it doesn't really make any sense right because there are some things that won't really um, um help your end goal so um with that in mind it just seems weird that um they would have surmised that uh, the diet industry is a virus. I don't think it is a virus. I think the way that people uh, are applying it as a virus and some diet industry professionals because they're masters at what they do in marketing are able to kind of reverse engineer and kind of direct their marketing, direct at the people that they are aware of have these kind of, you know, um, anxieties around food, whether it's a 30-day plan, a whole, whole 60. These key buzzwords will attract people like that because they'll be like, oh, it's only 60 days, but it's not. 60 days is a long time for somebody that's going to diet, right? Especially if you're not used to eating well or eating a certain way 60 days can be a long long fucking time and i think what should be happening in general is that you should have a go- like with everything you should have a goal in mind so if your goal in mind is to look good for a holiday to look good on a beach uh to fit into a particular dress there is, there should be a way that you approach it that is only for that thing but doesn't mean that you do it forever right so if you've got a wedding coming up there might be an optimal way for you to lose weight. It might be to cut out some carbohydrates, not eat sugar, right? Train five times a week. Only because you want to fit into that suit. Now, if after that fact, you tend to kind of veer off the course, you, your training days drop to three, you don't eat well all the time, fine. But you've done what you need to do to get into that suit. But that doesn't mean that that diet didn't or did not work or didn't work or did work. It just means that you had a particular goal in mind and you figured you tried to find the right diet that would work best for you because you know all our genes are different. Some people respond better to different things and eating whatever it may be. And then you just stuck to that plan until you reached your goal. But if you have an overall view of your life and how you want to live, right? In terms of I think some uh Walter Longo said uh healthy was it uh alive at 70, healthy at a hundred or something. Like you want to be healthy at 70 right you want to be like alex ferguson and stands like giggling and laughing and walking un- un- unassisted you want to be you want to head into an old age of young feeling young and vibrant if that's the case then there has to be an overall arc around how you kind of structure your life whether it's you know walking a lot whether it's drinking loads of water making sure you eliminate certain foods or only eat them at a certain occasion there has to be something that you do something it can't just be gluttony all over the place um and then the other point that I thought was very, very weird was this quote here. Um, if the wealth, if wellness influencers cared about health, they might tell you that yo-yo dieting in women may increase their risk of heart disease. 
according to a recent uh, preliminary study presented by the American Heart Association. They might um, also promote behaviours that increase community and connection, like going out for a meal with a friend or joining a book club. These activities are substantial and have been scientifically linked to improved health, yet are often at odds with the solitary, draining work of trying to micromanage every bite of food that goes into your mouth. Uh, again, bizarre, right? But, but weird, because... Again, the responsibility you're placing on an influencer to kind of dictate and to kind of inform how you do, how you can actually live completely is bizarre because on the same token, the other people will be like, oh, the influencers get paid too much money and it's stupid. So you have to choose what side you want to be on. Are they stupid and they have too much influence or should they be telling you exactly all the intricacies of dieting or malarkey? You know, for the most part, some of these skinny models that are on Instagram influencers, you know, for the most part, you have no idea about their life before Instagram. Most of the, especially some of the influencers I've kind of come across, especially in the fitness, health, the health, wellness um, scene, especially some of the girls, some of these, some of these girls have, have a background in athletics. Like, they are legit athletes. Like, you know, collegiate athletes, wrestlers, gymnasts, uh, cross-country runners, right? Who have now kind of, you know, found a lane, especially if you're a, a semi-attractive girl and you've got an actual athletics background, you can actually clean up on the internet. And I've never, I've really understood, I've never really got why um, young women on social media tend to gravitate to girls who obviously look like they've always been really fit and healthy the rest of the whole of their life, for the most part. It's very, very bizarre. You obviously see, there's a, there is a whole group of girls who have that, you know, really amazing before and after picture, but there is a lot of girls also on social media who are, it's very obvious that they've always been really, really fit, but girls tend to, you know, they still buy their workout plans and it's just, it's just very odd. But anyway, the fact is, it's quite obvious to tell the people that are just skinny for one thing, skinny because they don't eat, skinny because they've been working out a lot, and skinny because they are fucking obsessed with physical performance. There, You can obviously tell, right? So for the most part, if these people are promoting diets that are quote-unquote fad diets, then they're only answering the cause of their customers and clients. But generally what happens is that they put you into a funnel and say, hey, this is my fad diet. But in order to live a long and prosperous life, you need to follow this kind of other diet loosely than what you know than what you're doing. Like there might be a fad diet you get on for thirty days that allows you to lose thirty pounds, but to maintain that over a long period of time, you're gonna to need to do some other adjustments. You're going to need to change the way you eat, change the way you look, approach food, change the way you approach exercise. There are some things you're going, to, but they try and get they try and draw you in first with the fad diet. I think for the most part. So for someone to say, oh, they need to kind of break down exactly what's wrong with this and that. It's like, come on, you're a grown up. You should have to do the research yourself. You know what a fat diet should do. You know the uh, the dangers of a fat diet. You know that fat diet should be only done to achieve a short term goal. That's it. And if and if and even and even in that occasion, you should probably do away with it. If your holidays come up in two weeks, no matter how hard you train, you're never gonna have a six pack in two weeks, right? Just stop. Maybe if you're gonna go, I've done this plenty of time. If you're gonna go on a holiday. And you're going to go binge out for two weeks in Spain or binge out two weeks in the middle of Paris. Why not just eliminate all the sugary treats you're going to have in London and just kind of leave your sweet tooth uh, willing and open to kind of receive the pastry treats or the confectionery treats you might uh, stumble upon in Paris. That might be a good way to go about it. But to say you're going to do two weeks of training and you're going to turn into, you know, some buff body dude, it's not going to work. You know that for sure it's not going to work. So you don't need an influencer to tell you that. Again, it's a bizarre way to look at things. Um and um also a bit i thought was interesting in the conversation duh, duh, duh. and the whole idea behind the wellness program maybe promoting more you know selfish eating habits which couldn't be true i think for the most part though if you go to most offices in the uk um, and i think in the london especially is a good example because london is you know like most metropolitan cities people tend to look after mm, london probably is the same as la right not la is probably the pinnacle of it because the entertainment industry is there hollywood's there so people are more aware of what they look like and are more self-conscious but london is the same too i think for the most part most hip central londonish kind of offices have two or three people that are quite health obsessed that kind of leap, seeps, seeps into and influences others in the office so but if you look around most office spaces you worked in most people that eat at their desk or eat alone aren't really eating healthily anyway they're eating shit right they're eating the sandwich they're eating pasta and shit they're eating garbage food for the most part not really eating nutritional food they're just eating whatever they're eating uh most of the time people are eat, eating on their own because they want to plug unplug from the constant need to be talking right because you're at work you're always talking to somebody your manager your colleague someone you bumped into in, in the kitchen 
someone's always talking to you so you if anything at lunch you just want to kind of have your alone time right have you kind of sol- solitary or get on the phone talk to a boyfriend or girlfriend go in front of your mom i don't know whatever you want to just be on your own right so that kind of eat on your own thing isn't really to do that um, outside of that society I mean, social wise i think if somebody i think if anything there is more probably social pressure and maybe social bullying if you're the one on a diet and your friends aren't right and you start to order certain things on the menu they start to look at you a bit weird which is really annoying um it doesn't really work the other way around really for the most part um you're not really gonna make other people feel weird by bringing a salad to a, a lunch people's gonna just take the piss out of you so I, I don't really agree with that and i think for me by and large i tend to accommodate people like if i go to work and people want to go out and have lunch and they want to buy something i'll just take my tap or everything eat with them you know it's not no, no big deal um or if i've if we've been out and i want to order my i, I want i've got a particular thing i want to order i want to eat i'll just order the thing i want to eat i don't really you know care what anyone else has to say but again i just think it's bizarre that they're equating you know this whole society like how many times you really go out with your friends and eat out like it's not that often in the week and by and large if you're on a diet you can move around your cheat days if you want to and just do that with your friends it's not that hard to do like i don't and again i don't really see the neuroticism around that and then um the other one uh, that i thought was really insane uh was this quote from the, the the whole article um by this lady it says the following um let me try to get up on here actually because i think this might be a bit more interesting to kind of view on the video as well boom, boom, boom. i think it was what does it say um patriarchy right let's see she says something about a patriarchy i was like what the fuck it's a diet yeah so um the wellness industry here's, here's a quote that i thought was really really crazy right it says the following the wellness industry is the diet the wellness industry is the diet industry and the diet industry is a function of the patriarchal beauty standards under which women either punish themselves to become smaller or are punished for failing to comply what in the heck is she talking about right and the stress of this hurts our health too i'm a white i'm a thin white woman and the shame and derision i have experienced for falling for failing to be even thinner is nothing compared to what um women with less compliant bodies bear Wellness is largely white, privileged, enterprising, catering to largely white, privileged, already thin and able-bodied women. Promoting exercise only they have the time to do and task and care only there they have the resources to buy. That is just insane. Like to somehow equate um, patriarchal issues to health and wellness is just, I don't know, it's bizarre, man. It's bizarre. Is there, a, is there something to be said about, you know, um the disparity between healthy health healthy stores in you know affluent neighborhoods compared to poverty stricken neighborhoods yes i just look outside my window to see there's like 17 million chicken shops outside but you know we live it's 2019 i don't think it costs as much as it did in the past to eat healthy i also don't think that people in impoverished areas are that uneducated about what they're eating they're aware of what they're doing they just don't care they just want to you know they're just they're creatures of habit like all other people are in the same way that you know you go to MS, you go to pret manger the same buy the same shit all the time in the same way someone in the end is just going to go to a chicken shop or go wherever right it's just a creature of habit why would i travel extra far to eat when i can just eat while i want to eat just right here so to surmise or to assume that people in impoverished areas are not don't are not able to eat because they don't have the the resources too is crazy because you know eating healthy is you know is relatively cheap for the most part and to surmise that somehow the wellness industry is a thin white woman industry is weird like it's not really is it wellness is all about looking after oneself right mentally physically right in order to kind of be of better use to your overall community right it's kind of this whole idea about being the kind of virtue uh, selfish the virtues in selfishness right being able to look after yourself so you can look after others but in order to kind of you know this ideological based way of looking at things is just insanely 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 unproductive really right because even if that was true um how do you then go about navigating in the world what do you do then right you're a thin white woman who um, has a good metabolism then what do you do do you not talk about your weight do you not talk about the struggles you're having putting on weight do you not talk about the struggles you're having like what do you do like it's just a strange place to be in like in general it's just a bizarre way to look at things and i think in general the whole article has kind of have that kind of tinge in it. and again i don't know 
I think as a dude, it's hard to kind of speak about these kind of things because I think women in general have a very, very different way how they view their bodies and men do. But I just wish this wouldn't be a thing, man. I just wish people were able to kind of, you know, not be so hung up on how they look or not be so hung up on how other people might look at them, right? It's your body, right? Why would you care? Um, and also be uh, able to kind of not be bothered if other people really care about what they look like and want to make an effort to make sure they look really good in the things that they wear or things that they do. I don't, I don't know. I just not, I'm not bothered if like a girl on Instagram is promoting a, a diet lollipop because I know that's bullshit that you know appetite suppressing lollipop it doesn't really bother me because i think most people would sense know that that is you know it's just a fad thing like it's just another but whatever even if it is coming from a bad place or coming from a good place i know it serves their need right their kind of immediate need of having a snatched stomach or looking a certain way for an instagram picture i know that's what they're doing but for the general everyday person you can't go you can't live your life nine to five working monday to friday eating diet lollipops right? it's not going to work for you but if you're in la and you're spending your time sitting outside or you know hiking can't run in canyon and shit and attending gala events maybe you can get away with just you know sucking on a lollipop from time to time i don't know but i know i can't i'm, I'm worried about my council tax and my oyster cards and you know doing a good job at work and whatever it may be and being a good friend like i don't know i've got things i'm doing that i'm kind of preoccupied with right that I'm not going to do that. So, again, it's a very odd article, but I think in general it just speaks about the overall neuroticism we're all suffering from nowadays. And, again, it goes back to the whole idea behind, you know, I think you should be really concentrating on yourself, focusing on trying to make yourself better. I don't know. Why wouldn't you, man? You've got one life to live. Why not eke as much as you can out of it? Like, why just be accepting of just the way you are exactly the way you are? Like, I don't know. I don't get it. I just don't understand why you'd be happy just being exactly the way you are and not making any improvements in any aspects of your life whatsoever. Forget health, forget looking good, forget being skinny. Just in your life in general. There's nothing there's nothing you want to be able to improve. Why would you want to do that? It's just bizarre. Anyway, um I recommend you check it out. It's a really cool uh, um article regardless. It made me think about a lot of things as you can tell. I've been rabbiting on about this for a while now. But um this is the the article is called Smash the Wellness Industry, an article in the New York Times by one Jessica Neal. No, sorry, I, I'm I'm gonna I'm gonna buy one of her books as well. I think she's she's written a couple of books. I'm gonna check them out. So I definitely recommend you check out her books and just kind of engage with it in an open mind and disagree or agree, but I think it's gonna get you thinking regardless. Um yeah, so good work from her, even though I don't agree. So that's episode 222 of the Excellent Zinger Show. Uh, my hard drive is filling up, unfortunately, so I'm going to have to end right there. Thank you so much for tuning in. It's been a pleasure to have you as my um, lovely listeners and to me to be a presenter. Or Are you a podcast presenter? Can you be a presenter? I don't know if you can. Anyway, it doesn't matter. Um, anyway, um, 222, thanks so much for tuning in. As always, I'm going to be back tomorrow for an episode of the show. I'm going to try and do three this week, maybe five. That'll be amazing. Um, for all my details, go to my website, excellentzinger.com. You can find the link in the show descriptions. If you're watching via YouTube, leave me a thumbs up. Leave me a comment um, in order for people to come, you know, see the show. Not malarkey. If it's your first time here, why not subscribe and check out some more videos. If you're listening via the podcast app, then please leave me a five-star review. I've got a long way for people to see the show. I'm like, yeah, it's good as well for you to read your little reviews and get a little laugh and smile at something. Oh, that's nice. Um, and yeah, apart from that, you will see all my DJ gigs listings on my website, sonzinger.com. All my social media links will be there too. And I'll see you guys again very, very, very soon for the episode of the show. Until then, goodbye and take care, my friends.